Hello and welcome to episode 66 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast in which I talk about gardening and plants and the world of the green. I am broadcasting to you from late summer 2019. I spent yesterday foraging through high nettles in an abandoned orchard, so I'm stuffed full of apple crumble. You can probably hear it in my voice, the apple and the blackberries coming out. That means autumn is on its way. I'm also covered in nettle stings. The nettles do this strange late summer growth spurt. They've already done their flowering. They've got those big toothsome seed strains hanging off them, and they throw up a few more little leaves on top to stop people coming along and, and munching whole great mouthfuls of their seeds, I guess. Anyway, so I've got nettle stings up the forearms and a stomach full of apples, and all feels right with the world. This week on the podcast, we are going over a fairly eventful week in which I did some repair work, repairing the garden after the attentions of some other tradesmen. We did the hay cut, which is a sort of iconic back-to-school kind of job, in many ways because it happens at this time of year, but also because it leaves the garden shorn. It's like a schoolboy who has been allowed to grow his hair all summer holidays, and now if he tugs on it, tugs on it, he can just about see it at the top of his eyebrows, and he thinks he looks like a bohemian, but no, he is caught, caught in late September by his mother, and made to have a short back and sides, and suddenly everything is short and boring and dull, and no more crickets are living in his ears, and that's what's happened to the meadow. It is, after the events of this week, now once more stubble, waiting for us to collect the hay and cart it off. So I'm talking about that this week. I'm also talking about underplanting, how to create coherent underplanting schemes, how to stop them looking like horrible afterthoughts. It's an eventful and word-packed half hour, so I really should get on with the weekend gardening. Enjoy. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Week in Gardening, a week in which we, the Intrepid Garden team, endeavoured to make the garden look beautiful for the appreciative owners. Sometimes it's nice to explain the job in terms as prosaic as that. I was talking to my mother at the weekend, a very keen listener to the garden log, of course, as she is contractually obliged to be. And she was saying that, it's funny, you seem to see the world as one great big battle. A battle between the forces of, of good and evil and nature and man. And I'm sure there are other forces coming in, ancillary forces, arriving like Prussians, late to the battle. But I don't always see things as a battle. Sometimes I see it as a way to earn a crust and make a beautiful garden at the same time. And this was one of those weeks in which I, I did useful jobs, useful for the garden, useful for the garden visitors. Things like sinking cables left out by sloppy electricians. Electricians need to do things in gardens. You don't think about it, but actually a lot of gardens, ornamental gardens, are just big toy boxes for adults. And like toys within that box, they have light up bits and, and noisy bits. Our noisy bits are our cannons now, and our light up bits are our lights that focus on trees and shrubs and illuminating bits of the garden that I don't generally see because I'm not there in the evenings. And quite often these lights go wrong because either I will dig through them with a spade, which is quite a, quite a hobby of mine, or they'll get water in some sort of junction box, in which case you seem to have to take the whole garden apart, looking for, for wherever this troublesome leak is. And something like that had been going on, so there are cables left out all over the beds where they've been dug up. Not too many plants dug up alongside them, as sometimes happens. But I did, a, I did some proper digging of trenches and laying the cables down next to paths and pegging them out, so they'll be in a more sensible place for the future. And we don't have to look at this building site, black spaghetti sprawling all over the flower beds and ruining things. After that, I cut back 
like some of the the herbs and lavender. We have this very strange herb bed. It looks like a sort of stylized flower. If you looked at it from above, it has a, a sensual bed, which is a vast old millstone. And as millstones do, it has a hole in the center of that, in which an upright cultivar of rosemary is planted. If you imagine a, a daisy type flower, one of those flowers with a, with a yellow disc in the middle, made up of the little, little florets, and then the, the big white ray petals coming off the side of it. If you imagine one of those, then the rosemary is the disc of yellow in the middle, and the florets are these blobby oval beds, each planted with a different herb. It's a, it's a strange layout. Actually, it only, looks, it only really looks like a flower from above if, you, if your flowers were designed by sort of corporate logo designers who want to make everything very clear and stylized. It looks a bit like that until you grow herbs in it and then they all grow into each other and then suddenly what you have is a vast mass of green with nothing to distinguish it and no paths between it. So I waded into the sea of green and started to judiciously hack back some of the more rampant herbs. The tarragon this year is out of control. I think that's partly because no one uses it. You can really do some damage to a mint crop by making a mojito. But there is no tarragon cocktail. There is just tarragon in butter on some carrots. Or tarragon maybe on a, on a piece of fish. And this does not require a whole bed. So the tarragon is left to grow and then flop and, and start bothering its neighbours. So I took some of that back. I also took the lavender back very close to its old wood. Taking it back to the last of the silver leaves emerging. So that it looks like a sort of skinhead pensioner. One of the old original skinheads who's now gone grey, but it's still buzzing his hair and it's growing back in. But it's very much the, the shade of a, a precious metal of a, of a snowy morning on his scalp. So that's what the lavender looks like now. It's nice, nice and round and domed. And it just looks slightly neater. I think you can get away with abundant, verdant green when it's all fresh. But some of the stems have decided to give up. Some of the stems are flowered, so have old bits and pieces hanging on to the end of them. They're just looking irregular and end of season. And at this time of year, sometimes taking it back to an architectural structure looks better. I generally argue against the blobification of plants within the garden, but sometimes a judicious bit of reshaping really helps the rest of the plants around them and retains a little bit of freshness, which is what we're looking for at this time of year. On Tuesday, we did the hay cut, the cut in the meadow, where we will slice down all of those tall, flowered meadow grasses and all of the wild flowers that lurk in between them and scoop them off to continue impoverishing the soil, to continue removing the organic matter so that we get even more flowers in the future. We're doing it much later than we did last year, because the meadow is still doing things. Last year, because it was so dry and so hot for such a long time, leading up to the end of August, the meadow had really stopped doing anything by about the last week of July. There was no growth, there were no real new flowers coming through. Now it's still, it's still going, it's still trying to put things out. And I've been clinging on, hoping and hoping that the carrots, the wild carrots, will set seed and scatter everywhere. But the majority of them aren't going to quite make it. I've taken the first seeds from the first ones that came out and scattered them where I can. But I just need to get the cut done now because the weather's going to change. We need dry weather to get it down, to get it cut, to get it laid out and dried before we rake it all up. So unfortunately, like a, like a child left at the museum by his departing class, I had to get back on the coach. I had to cut down the meadow with the flowers of the wild carrot still standing. There is a chance they will carry on maturing like fruit within the fruit bowl. I don't know if you've seen it recently. Supermarkets have started selling incredibly underripe produce labelled as ripen in the bowl. As if you can be a part, you too can do the last bit of the growing of this food's journey. It happened within your kitchen. Anyway, I'm hoping that this meadow seed will, will not ripen in the bowl, but will ripen in the field. And there will still be some viable stuff scattered around when we do the rake up next week.
The hay cut is an iconic job. There's nothing that anchors us to the time of the year more than the cut. It's one job that gets done once and definitively and only in late summer. And when it happens, you know, you know what time of year it is. And it changes everything so, so dramatically to see the garden at eight o'clock in the morning with all of these wonderful flickering grass spires, all of the seeds bobbing around and dancing with each other. And then see it at the end of the day, sorry mother, but like a battlefield with all its soldiers mown down. It's quite a moving spectacle. It's also bloody hard work pushing the scythe mower, the, the power scythe, across that thing, juddering around, your forearms shaking, your teeth rattling as the thing chunters through this grass. For the first time ever, we didn't go over a wasp nest, which really helps if you don't have to run away screaming every 10 minutes and then tentatively come back and see if they've left the lawn mower long enough for you to restart it. You don't have to run to the first aid kit and see if anyone's going to go into anaphylactic shock or anything like that. You can just get on with cutting up and down. And partly it was quicker because the mower didn't shake itself to pieces this year, which is quite a bonus for, for power scythes if you're using them all day. They do have a tendency to behave a bit like unbalanced washing machines and sort of blow themselves apart in a, a frenzy of mechanical exuberance. This time, no, not at all. And I think the third reason that it was quicker was because we really have reduced the thickness of the grass with a copious amount of yellow rattle. The meadow was thick with yellow rattle by the end of the summer, and the seed heads had all dried, and so the meadow did rattle as you walked through it. That's where it gets its name from. We'd swish through the grass, and it would give this tiny little rattling sound as the seeds came out. So maybe, just maybe it's doing its job, or maybe it's the power of wishful thinking. Maybe it is just us wanting to believe in this little parasitic plant so much, just because it is such a cool trick. It is such a good way of using nature on nature. We want it to work. We want it to work so much. And um, it seems to be, but then again, I suppose that's how cults form, isn't it? The human mind has an incredible ability to delude itself. Anyway, let's pretend. Let's pretend that the rattle did its job. Let's pretend that we were advancing, that this year was better than the previous years due to judicious husbandry, not to more well-oiled machinery. Anyway, the real hard work will come next week. It's the collecting that is the pain, getting all of this flat hay down off the ground into piles and then off into a, into a large stack somewhere. I think it's because you can't collect it with the ride-on mower. Well, at least our ride on mower. The power scythe cuts it once at the bottom of the stem, so you get long sticks of grass, long wiry flowering stems, three foot long, and those wrap around the cutting blades on our ride on mower. The ride on mower is actually, the blades aren't particularly long. They're only the length of a domestic lawn mowers. They just have three of them in a sort of chevron shape on the deck below, and they get stopped by these things. They snare them like, like wire. And I think that, well, maybe next year we either need to get a better ride on mower, a better collecting ride on mower, then do the hay cut and then scoop them all up. Or maybe do the hay cut with a flail mower. That's what I'm thinking. If we do a flail mower cut instead of a power scythe cut, then we'll probably damage some of the seeds, but we'll mush the grass up a lot more, mush it into a green sort of fibrous throff upon the upon the waves of the meadow and then we can leave that to dry for a week and maybe it'll be collected by the ride on more effectively so uh, so watch this space anyway next week you'll get to hear all about the the bicep draining sweat pouring effort that normally comes from from clearing a whole meadow with just a rake a hay fork and a couple of wheelbarrows for now though we don't have to think of that effort for now all we can do is picture the sweet smelling grass slowly drying under the late summer sun. On Wednesday, I moved on to matters completely different and redid an area under this huge cotinus we've got towards the bottom of the garden. This is Cotinus cogigrea. I don't know what the cultivar is, one of the big leafed purple ones. I think there's a Cotinus cogigrea grace, which is very commonly used. You will have seen it in gardens you've visited. Uh, Cotinus is the, the smoke bush. It has those wonderful fluffy clouds of flowers. Then the understory of this cotinus was confusing. It was hard to look at because it was jumbled. It was sort of underplanted, but it was underplanted with 
the wrong sort of mix of plants. It was underplanted with hellebores, with aquilegias, with Welsh poppies and with crocosmia, all of which are plants that will grow in shade. I mean, the hellebore thrives in shade. Aquilegia does pretty well in shade and Welsh poppy and crocosmia will both grow and will both flower in shade, just not very well. And all of these plants are the wrong shape and form and texture for underplanting. They are too scrappy, too effervescent, too too willing to do their own thing. And underplanting, you want something that forms a, a mat almost, or a wafting savanna canopy, a plant that blends with its neighbours, that becomes that becomes a surface, a matte surface, a glossy surface, a textured surface, whatever, that isn't a load of individual plants. All of these look like individual plants, and they look like raggedy, ratty old individual plants. So I pulled them all out, bar the hellebores. The hellebores on their own, without all this fluff around them, look quite stately and serene and glossy-leaved. They look like plants that were designed to lurk beneath a purple-leaved monster. So the other ones got taken out, and uh, it looked far less fussy, and I gave the area a really good thick mulch with our homemade compost. The key we have discovered to using our homemade compost as a mulch now is to filter it ridiculously fine. Before we were using a, a metal sieve with holes at about just over a centimetre square. Probably, probably a centimetre and a half square. So big enough to take out rocks and sticks, but small enough to let through things like beach kernels. We've now switched to using a very fine filter, a filter that takes these things out, that's probably half a centimetre square, that takes out all kernels, that takes out little bits of twig that never decomposed, that takes out chipped wood that didn't quite have enough time to break down. And it means that we have a vast amount of spoil from the heap, which we're putting into rough areas of the garden, under hedges, areas that will be cultivated in the distant future, areas that need building up, prospective banks, and this absolutely perfect, pure, grade A compost, the good stuff we are using as a mulch. And this is of no nutritional benefit for the plant. I'm sure actually big lumpy compost is better for the soil. You get air gaps and different things. It's like a party. A good compost has all sorts of different types within it to get things mixing, to get things going together. But, uh, but a really fine compost just stops the blackbirds digging through it. If they do dig through it, they can push the tiny particles aside with their beak. They don't have to flick great stones out of the way and heave beech kernels around with their, with their beaks to try and find the worms below. Which means your paths are a lot cleaner and you don't have to go in every morning and sweep away the blackbird damage. And it's small changes like this, small changes that lead to a crisper garden and a slightly easier life for the gardener. So there's a tip for you if you're making homemade compost and using it as a mulch. Fine as possible round stone paths, rough as you like, in the middle of flower beds, a couple of feet back. On Thursday I delved into the realm of garden history. Nothing particularly interesting to report there. Next week I am off to the archives within the Natural History Museum, which I think will be great fun. I am anticipating taxidermy bears and ancient old bearded gentlemen who looked like they were corresponding with Darwin back in the day. But, uh, but for now, it was just run-of-the-mill Metropolitan Archives in London. And then I was back, back to work on Friday. I got the pressure washer out and washed some paths. And I was washing the paths because it is Blackberry season. And any of you who have spent time in Blackberry season in the great outdoors knows what this means for paths and those that live above the paths. So I did a bit of that, and then I did some anticipatory watering. We're going to get a big dry and hot spell, so it was just pumping things full of water that looked finickety, that looked like they might need some of it. And then it was deadheading time, deadheading the dahlias. The poor old dahlias, this year is not a dahlia year. It started well. It started with that heat while they were thrusting their leaves out. But dahlias, they need midsummer and late summer heat, and there hasn't been quite enough of it yet. 
So they're flowering, they're flowering well, they're flowering prolifically. I don't grow them for show, so I don't do any of the pinching off of the side buds and concentrating on just a few perfect dinner plate sized blooms. I grow them as border flowers, so I want a profusion. I want them like a spray of roses rather than one big bloom tucked behind your ear. I want them everywhere like little constellations. So I don't mind the fact that the flowers are small. I just like them to be a bit taller. The Bishop series with the dark leaves are reliable. They're, they're doing their thing, but they're probably a foot shorter than they were at this time last year. The pom-pom forms likewise. They're just, they're just smaller. They're not as mighty a plant. I'm quite sad about that. I thought the point of having tubers was that you made use of a really, really good summer and came back even better next year. Certainly when they put them in the ground, their root systems were ginormous. So what on earth they've been doing? Maybe they haven't been fed enough this year. We fed them, but not, not religiously. It hasn't been a routine. There hasn't been a chart on the door, a little sign saying, have you fed your dahlias? Maybe we need that for next year. Maybe we could have a monster daily a year. I think that's enough talking about what I did in the garden this week. Shall we go and see if there are any horticultural recommendations for you this week? Just one recommendation this week, and it is a trade show. So if you have never heard a gardener wax poetic about a trade show before, then listen up. This trade show is going to be in Battersea in a couple of weeks' time on the 17th. I think it's on the, the 17th and 18th of September. And it's full of all sorts of interesting vendors selling you paving solutions and things to turn your suburban garden into the Palace of Versailles. But it's also going to have me speaking to, to industry people. I'm doing a seminar there. I'm doing a seminar on the historic garden, on how to design and revamp a historic garden without destroying the essential essence of the place, the thing that makes it special, the thing that gets people going into the archives and, and reading about its history and finding out where did the money come from? Was it tobacco or was it slaves? We want to keep the, the echoes of those people around and I'm going to show you how to do it while still making things pretty and, and planting dahlias and doing all of that sort of nonsense. And the thing is that it is a trade show but the public can come along and they can just go in. They can, you could just go in for the, the hour and 15 minutes in which I'm speaking, which I believe is from 11.30 until... 12.45, something like that, on Tuesday the 17th. You can just go in and see that, and then leave again. You're in London, you're in Battersea Park. It's beautiful. Got those, those fantastic Victorian semi-tropical gardens where they've planted the island bed full of palms. They've got that weird peace pagoda on the river. Great park to look at generally. And then all of London is your oyster. You can head across the river. You could go to the Natural History Museum. You could book yourself in for a session in the archives, go and find some letters from, from Alfred Russell Wallace, something like that. Anyway, the, the point is that if you want to come and hear me talk about something, you can do so. And I will put a link in the, the bio under here. And I'll also put a link on the Facebook group and on my Twitter and Instagram, showing you what to click through to get sent a ticket to, to come and see me. It would be really nice for me to have an audience because I haven't really spoken at these things before and I have this, this terrible vision of spending an hour giving my talk to the guy who helped set up the laptop and asking him if he has any questions at the end and then him not meeting my eye and waiting for the next speaker and all of us shuffling out of there feeling rather ashamed. So if someone can come and save me from that, then I really would be very, very appreciative. So come along to that. And there are there are millions of other speakers doing all sorts of incredibly enjoyable things. Some of them at exactly the same time, unfortunately, as I'm doing mine. But, but go onto the website, you can find a whole list of whoever is speaking and the topics on which they have chosen to, to educate the world. 
My other recommendation, of course, is to enjoy yourself in the garden. It's later than you think. The season is rushing on. Get out there whenever you can. Go and look at things. There are loads of crickets at the moment. I don't think they're proper. No, they are crickets. They're crickets. They're called the oak bush cricket. It's a very bright green cricket that you get only at the end of summer. I think it's only in the south of England and London. But it comes out at the end of summer and it gets everywhere. I had one in my pint of beer. And then I had it briefly in my mouth but it survived, it's okay. They're out all about the place. I see them on the windscreen of cars, hopping around, and it's it's another sign, it's like the hay cut, that things are moving to a close. They're lying face up in the grass with a, with a paper bag and a shirt on. Will not be possible soon. We'll need blankets with plastic sides to them and all sorts of preparatory work. We'll end up with, with wet bottoms and, and grass stains. So, so get out there while the garden living is easy. I'm off to do something very similar myself. I think I will read a book in the garden. I hope you enjoy your week, whether you manage to do any gardening or not. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. Goodbye.